You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. We're looking at the essence of the Reformation again this morning. And in this portion of our study of the Reformation, we're going to be considering the solas. That is, sola gracia, which is by grace, sola fide, through faith, and sola Christos, in Christ. These are the three solaces of the Reformed theology that was stood for throughout the Reformation age. As we consider this, I will give you a little bit of my background. I was raised in a Catholic home and uh, went through some of the early sacraments that the Catholics practiced, that is, my parents had me baptized as an infant. I went through catechism and then went through the sacrament of penance, communion, and then later confirmation. So I have a basic understanding of Catholicism as to its practice when I was a child. However, I've been further enlightened more thoroughly by this study that was going on in Sunday school and which has been very well presented and continued as R.C. Sproul gives the history of Catholicism. Today we have a bit of a attitude of negativism towards doctrine and theology. Many have considered that unworthy or not even useful today and especially when it comes to church history. Many haven't even studied church history, and when you speak of the Reformation, some claiming to be evangelical don't even understand the essence of what the Reformation was and what it means today. So there's actually a lack of, in many areas of the evangelical church today, a lack of pure theology being taught and the visible church in many areas is being tossed about by every wind of doctrine, trying to have their felt needs met and getting their ears tickled. They proclaim a man-centered gospel, which is not Christ-centered, and today there's actually a plethora of prophets and teachers who proclaim to have extra revelation Martin Luther was outraged by such claims by prophets of his day. There was a man in the 13th century by the name of Thomas Aquinas. He was a monk, and he wrote what was called his Summa Theological, which means theological summary. Some theologians and philosophers considered this a masterpiece. This saving grace, said Aquinas, comes to men exclusively through the channel of the divinely appointed sacraments placed in the keeping of the church, the visible, organized Roman body led by the Pope, end quote. Aquinas held to the seven sacraments practiced by Catholic the church. First, baptism and baptism, penance, the Lord's Supper, confirmation, marriage, ordination, or extreme unction. Now, Cornell is going to cover much of these uh, sacramental errors and practices when he presents this next Sunday. The gospel has been buried under the traditions of men. They broke from Christian worship and added liturgy. Only the clergy were allowed to interpret the Bible. Relics and saints were venerated. They worshiped Mary 
and the saints and bowed down before statues. Confession was made to a Catholic priest and not to God. In the sixth century, the heretical doctrine of purgatory was introduced. This was supposedly an interim place where souls go to pay for their penance of sins in order to purify them so that they could make their way to heaven. Penance was also made through indulgences paid to the papacy. Now, last week, the uh, mention of the treasury of merits was given in Sunday school, and Jim mentioned some of the elements of this practice of the papacy. The Catholic Church also promotes the concepts of mortal sin and venial sin. Now, the mortal sin is something that was done such as murder or perhaps adultery or fornication. And if a person dies in the state of mortal sin, according to the Catholic teaching, teaching they'll be, their souls are lost forever. However, they do have a remedy for the mortal sin. It is the sacrament of penance, which brings a person back into the relationship with God. A venial sin, however, is a lesser sin, like slander or lying, reviling, but it doesn't break fellowship with God, supposedly, or result in the soul being eternally separated from God. But penance is still required. This faulty view of salvation in which justification is a process and other sins do not sever that relationship. The biblical view, which we'll make clear later on in this morning, is the essence of God's imputed righteousness to all those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. The Christian is declared righteous because of that imputed righteousness. Luther began to criticize the theology of indulgences. And in his sermons, he would joke, when I was young, a Dominican, and then John Tetzel was preaching throughout Germany on the fundraising. Jim mentioned this. It was also in the Sunday school uh, for the last week or so. To complete the construction of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, in exchange for a contribution, Tetzel boasted he would provide donors with an indulgence that would even apply beyond the grave and free souls from purgatory. He had the little jingle, which is quite known, well known among the reformers. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. This left the people with a false sense of security and a false sense of salvation. Didn't remove guilt, it accomplished absolutely nothing. However, the Vatican and the papacy said that anyone who criticized indulgences was guilty of heresy. And the punishment for heresy at that point from the papacy was death. Because of the man-centered gospel today, I believe that it would not be, people believe that it wouldn't be fair if God were to punish the unjust if he's truly a loving God. Well, let's consider this. Is God just in salvation? What is the biblical answer to that question? And that's what I want to examine today. First, all human beings deserve hell. Not heaven, but hell. Since the fall, man's sin entered the world through Adam. That happened in Genesis 3. However, in Romans 12, Paul also brought forth this teaching so that we'd have further understanding. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. We all deserve condemnation for our sin. That is justice. If God were to do anything other than send every human being to hell, he wouldn't be just. However, Christ came here on earth in human form 
lived a sinless and perfect life, suffered and died on the cross, was resurrected, raised from the dead on the third day, and was resurrected and sits at the right hand of the Father. Christ came here to provide a way of salvation for all those who place their faith in him. Any individual who is to be saved, it's only by God's mercy. Now there's a difference between God's mercy and his justice. Justice is what we deserve because of what we have done. Mercy has nothing to do with what we have done or not done, but it is only by the will of God. In Romans chapter 9, Paul says this, and he's quoting actually back to Exodus 33, verse 19. But Paul says this in Romans, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Our salvation is because of God's mercy, not because of his justice. Third, even if God saved people on the basis of something supposedly in them, good works or something else, this wouldn't be justice since some people have different backgrounds and are unequal from others. If God saved some and not others on the basis of good works, which some people believe, then there'd never be justice. Aside from that, Paul points out in Romans 3 that there is none who does good, not one. There's nothing we can do to please God. And that was reiterated in the Old Testament in Isaiah. All our works, any of our supposedly righteous deeds are as filthy rags. They're worthless. The only perfect and good sacrifice was offered by our Lord. At the time of the Reformation, man-made traditions had kept people in bondage. The Reformation brought light to truth of Scripture and the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Most today don't even think that's relevant. But we're still battling today for the scriptures and for the truth of the gospel. The gospel, as I mentioned, is watered down to people's felt needs, and we don't have the understanding that we should. <clears throat> so as we continue to consider the aspects of justification through scriptures alone and grace alone, received by faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. The Reformation called the church back to the true gospel through the solas. <clears throat> Sola gratia, Ephesians 2, 5 through 8. We already looked at that. As we consider Paul going through this teaching this morning, what Jim read just prior to the sermon, Paul said this in Romans 4 in verse 9, for we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of faith, which he had while uncircumcised, that he had <clears throat> might be with the father of all those who believe without being circumcised. That righteousness might be credited to them. Circumcision, of course, at that time was a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham that was made back in Genesis 1 chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In this text, Paul cites Abraham as the father of all who believe. The promise was fulfilled that two, he also promised him that he would be the father of many nations. This was fulfilled in a twofold manner. First, through the loins of Abraham would come many multitudes of people, Jews and Arabs alike. The nation of Israel, and the Arab nation would be Abraham's offspring. The firstborn of Abraham was Ishmael, who was 
son of Hagar, the Egyptian handmaid, and the covenant child, the promised child, Ishmael, was born, <clears throat> came through Sarah and Abraham. Isaac was the promised child. As we consider the Old Testament picture of salvation by faith, Paul reiterates it, of course, again in Galatians 3, 6 through 8. The essence of needing salvation is because of man's deadness in his sin. Now, David covered that last week, and Jim covered Sola Scriptura the week before. As we consider man's deadness, we're spiritually dead, unable to respond to anything spiritually. There is nothing that man would do to turn himself to God. As Romans also says in chapter 8 that the man in the flesh is at enmity with God. Man in the flesh is one that's unregenerate, unsaved. So any unsaved individual is not on his own volition, his own desire, going to turn to God. It requires God regenerating and drawing those people to himself. The Reformation sought to preserve the purity of this truth. <clears throat> As we consider the sola, sola fide, sola grace, sola fide in sola Christos, we have to consider what it is that Christ accomplished. We have to look at our salvation through grace alone, through faith alone, and now we have to consider who it is that that faith and grace is applied to. In the book of John, which was done a couple of years back in chapter 1, or Christ identified himself as he's the word and he was the living God. So as we look at 14, chapter 14, Christ said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And in Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven and earth that has been given among men that must be saved. We must be saved. Throughout church history, there have been many religious cults and many false teachers. As we stray away from the true gospel, we find that this false gospel has been perpetrated. Many have fall, fallen into the trap of religion, which was presented and brought forth by Catholicism. If our salvation is by faith alone and Christ alone and not of ourselves, then just exactly how are we made just? This is the big question. But Paul condenses that with a very clear and concise answer in the book of Romans, chapter 3. He says this in verses 21 through 24. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Justification is the only solution for man's sin. We're dead in our trespasses and sins until Christ reaches down and justifies us by his grace. The word justification comes from the Greek word diakonos, which denotes the act of pronouncing righteous or an acquittal or to establish a person to make him just. So in what sense do we become righteous? Do we become righteous for our own comfort so we're able to do better things in this life? No. We are made the righteousness of God to bring glory to God. In this sense, 
we are the righteousness of God because of the imputation of Christ's righteousness to all who have placed their faith in him. We become his righteousness by imputation through the union with Christ. So what does this word impute? Well, gizomai in the Greek, but it means to reckon or put to one's account. It's an accounting term in the original language, but it means that God, his perfect righteousness is put to our account. We're not righteous. It is in Christ's righteousness that we stand before God and his alone. That's what people often confuse. They say, well, I'm a righteous man now. No, your righteousness is in Christ Jesus if you have indeed placed your faith in him for forgiveness of your sin and salvation. He will then produce through you by his grace good works. In the New King James Version in Romans 4.11, it says that he, Abraham, might be the father of all those that believe, though they are uncircumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed unto them. It reads, imputed in the King James Version, in the New King James Version, and yet we have in the New American Standard, in NIV, the word is translated credited. I found an older copy of a, a American Standard Version and it also used the word imputed, but it was later on translated as credited. Now it is written for his sake, speaking once again of Abraham, that was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and raised up because of our justification. The believer's sins, all the sins are imputed to Jesus Christ, which he paid the penalty for on the cross. And his righteousness, in turn, is imputed to all those that place their faith in him. And that's what the imputation is. This imputed righteousness is the sole ground of our justification. That is how we stand justified before Jesus Christ. All righteousness, as I mentioned before, is worthless. It's only that which is done in Christ Jesus. God only accepts perfection, which doesn't even exist in man. It is only in Christ alone. We are united on the basis of his grace through faith in Christ alone. This is a way man could be made right with God. Faith is essential. It's not a mental assent. Many people will make a profession of faith and say they believe in Jesus Christ for their, as their savior but it is more than just a mental assent to the truths that are presented in the gospel. It is a life-changing, total trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and recognition of our sin before him and also to recognize apart from him, our sin could not be redeemed. Payment for our sin could not be paid other than that which was done through our Lord Jesus Christ. The essential biblical doctrine of justification and the Reformation doctrine of sola gratia, sola fide, and sola Christos is the concept of the imputation of the righteousness of Jesus Christ to the believer. Historically, Rome has always contended on the basis of justification that it is the righteousness of Christ but also a righteousness that is infused into the believer rather than imputed. So what does that mean? Infused righteousness. According to Catholicism, according to the Catholic doctrines, this righteousness that you have in Christ is of 
blessing of grace that you receive through doing a cooperation with God and performing good deeds in accordance with your belief in God. That's the Catholicism view. It's a works doctrine and it's a heretical doctrine. We sometimes view the Catholics as uh, an enemy of the church. Well, their doctrines are heretical. And we should consider Catholics as the mission field. We're talking about a billion plus mission field. When we consider a Catholic, we have to recognize that they have been duped and brought into a false teaching, a heretical teaching, that has caused them to follow a false sense of understanding of the gospel. They have no understanding of the gospel and they're destined for eternal torment. They're not destined for heaven. There's no amount of good deeds they can do and the papacy is not going to save them and neither is there a purgatory. So we must look at them as the mission field. Essential to the biblical doctrine of justification as we consider these major doctrines there's two irreconcilable methods of ju justification. When I say irreconcilable, the Catholicism view and the Reformed view can never be brought together, regardless of what they tried to accomplish in the evangelical Catholic together, which was only a facade. It was just a means of bringing people together, and now, the church is considered more as a, a moral high ground to do good deeds in the world. The reformers believe that we're justified only through God's grace and by faith alone. I have to say that we have such a, a dearth in the evangelical church today of sound teaching that so many people are sitting in chairs and pews and churches today that have not proclaimed the true gospel, thinking that they are going to have eternal life with God in heaven, and yet have never come to repentance and never turned to Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible, not the one presented in many churches today, and never truly have been regenerated by Jesus Christ alone. We look at them also, at the, those vast numbers of people who think they're saved, and if you have a friend or a relative that you come across that cannot articulate the understanding of the true gospel, don't mock them, don't try to challenge them, Bring them, by God's grace, if you have opportunity, bring them to the knowledge of the truth. Offer the true gospel of Jesus Christ. So many today would reject that, even if they say they're Christians. They would perhaps consider that legalistic, but there's nothing legalistic about the gospel. In fact, the reformers went away from the legalistic papal practices and understood the true gospel. When I was practicing Catholicism as a child, I used to offer indulgences for my sins as I confessed them to a Catholic priest. And as my sins increased, the amount of coin that I had to drop into the box after my confession increased. So it became that I started out with nickels and dimes and progressed to quarters, 50 cent pieces, dollars, but I could never do anything that would take away sin. I didn't have any understanding. When I was presented with the gospel and when God opened my eyes and my heart to the truth of the gospel, it brought me to tears because I had followed a false religion 
for so many years. I had walked away from it because I saw the fallacy in it. There was never any change in my life. It was a nothing but guilt throughout. And yet when I came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and I understood that salvation was not by anything that I could do or have done, but solely on the merit of Jesus Christ, and it was by God's grace alone, by faith alone, which also is of God, in Christ alone, it broke me. This morning, I would like to close with this. As we think of God's glorious gospel, and how God gives grace daily to us, we must not take that grace for granted. God gives us grace to be saved. He also gives us grace daily to live by. We shouldn't be living as pagans. If we see a Christian who's living like a pagan and sounding like a pagan and acting like a pagan, that man needs to go before God and to really truly examine himself, to see whether he's in the faith. We should be, by God's grace, producing good works by God's grace. We should be bringing glory to God's name, not just honor, but true glory and honor to God, only by his grace. When the antinomians were claiming that, well, if grace abounds, that we should just continue to sin so we could have greater grace in Romans 5, verse 20. Paul answered, he had a response for that in Romans 6. He said this, may genita, may it never be, may you never continue to use sin as a license. Paul greatly attack the false understandings of God's grace. We need to realize that his grace is abundant for each believer daily. We never lack sufficiency as he continues the sanctification process in us. It is God from start to finish. He is the author and finisher of our faith. The author of Hebrews makes that clear. And as we think of God's grace, I would like to close with this. Sola de gloria. To God be the glory. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.